from Television City in Hollywood. Chrysler Corporation, maker of these five great cars. Plymouth. Dodge. DeSoto. Chrysler. And the exclusive Imperial, the five great cars of the forward look. Chrysler Corporation presents Climax. Tonight starring Wendell Corey, Gene Hagen, Harry Carey Jr., James Gregory, Harry Town. And now your host for Chrysler Corporation, Bill Lundigan. You know, this week after a winter's hibernation, the baseball parks of America have suddenly come to life again. Flagstaffs wear bright new bunting, turnstiles click, men in blue shout play ball, prominent citizens from mayors to the president throw out the, the first ball, and from packed bleachers comes a mighty roar that won't be stilled until autumn. Many loyal baseball fans will remember a beloved figure who, not many seasons past, was an important part of this scene. A man whose moving personal story of love, courage, and heartbreak was as stirring as his greatest triumphs on the diamond. Tonight on Climax, the Lou Gehrig story, a new dramatic picture of the, the Iron Horse himself, written especially for Climax by Mel Goldberg. This is Granton Rice, talking to you from the press box of the New York Yankee Stadium, where in just a little while, the ceremonies honoring Lou Gehrig will get underway. I've been asked to tell you, as briefly as I can, a little bit about the man, Lou Gehrig, and why upwards of 60,000 fans and countless celebrities from all walks of life are here today to pay final tribute to the Iron Horse of Baseball. Today, at the age of 36, Lou is a very sick man, perhaps a dying man. But let's turn away for a brief moment from the shattered iron horse we see here today for a brief look at the Garrick you and I, and especially Lou, would want you to remember. 1927. Lou's second full season as a Yankee, a batter marked for greatness. At the beginning, a clumsy fielder, he worked at it. He learned. They never called him clumsy again. He gave it all he had, at the plate and on the bases. In his time, for all time, one of the most fearsome sluggers in baseball history. And now he became known as the Iron Horse, season after season, game after game, defying sickness, pain, and injury. Among baseball fans everywhere, the fabled Garrett, the beloved Garrett, the indestructible Gary. It was just a relatively unimportant early season ball game. But for Lou, the game was to be a crucial. There's two down at the top of the ninth. The bases jammed with the White Sox, and the base hit now could win it all. So the Yankees are in serious trouble. Their ball game is in jeopardy. There's a sign. There's a stretch. Pitch. It's a bounding ball down the first baseline. Gehrig is up. No, it's by him. It's into right field for a base hit. He couldn't come up with a ball. It's a tough break, folks. It was a sharply hit ball. Let's say that Lou just missed making a nice play. bench the guy. I mean it. For the good of the team, he ought to get benched. He's through. You think he'd bench himself for crying out loud? 
So he's played in over 2,000 games in a row. What are we supposed to do? Eat that record of his if it costs us a pennant this year? I mean, we've got to think of ourselves, too, you know? You talk awful loud for a little guy, Rusty. Anybody wants to hear what I got to say, Dickie, I'll say it right to his face. And that includes the great Garrick. Swung on before for telling the truth? For telling the truth, Rusty? He lost me a ball game this afternoon. We lost a ball game this afternoon. We, meaning the Yankees. It was my ball game to win, a lousy ground ball. How many ball games did you win last year, Rusty? I was in the bullpen half the season. Yeah, but you took your share of the World Series, though the Lou helped the win, didn't you? Look, I ain't saying he wasn't a great ball player. All I'm saying is he ain't helping the team now. I booted one for you, kid. I'm sorry. Look, look, look. I ain't, I ain't griping about losing a ball. Why don't you just button your lip? Why don't you just button your lip? Too, Maggie. Shut the door. Those stakes will be burnt. Never mind the stakes. Just close the door, will you? That's Dizzy Dean on the mound for the National League All Stars. He's getting ready to blow that fast one past the mighty Gary. Now watch the feet, honey. And there it goes. The low line drive that will go all the way. Well? Well, it seems to me you were stepping into the ball. That's right, I was. Now I'm so anxious to hear them crowding that plate and they're throwing them in close. I don't even have to look at that film we've been taking this week. I know that's it. I'm crowding it. That could be. I know it is. Look, I'll show you. I mean, here's the plate. I got the and I just keep inching it. And I'm inching it. And they throw me in a close one and I pop it up. But if I'll get back here, dig in and stay here, that same inside pitch. Right on the fat of the bat. Look, honey, I'll, I'll share the stuff we took this week. Mrs. Garrick, if we don't get with... Uh, look, Maggie, you don't have to hang around. We'll be at least an hour. Oh, I don't mind. Oh, come on out. You're not out. Get going. Okay. Well, I got a couple of tickets for the opera. Are you interested? Aren't you? Uh, I don't think so, no. Okay. Mrs. Garrick, he's been looking at those films for over a week now. What's he trying to find? The guy who hit the home run off Dizzy Dean. Ready in two shakes. Everything has to be playing all the time. Put it on for you. I thought you liked it. I do. Who wants to live in Carnegie Hall? You know, maybe I should have married Toscanini. I could have, you know. He's been after me for years. But I look at the guy and I ask myself, how many homers did he hit last year? <laughs> oh, look who's laughing. The way I'm hitting, I could be using the baton. Oh, no. 
No, I don't believe it. The dour Dutchman finally got off a good one. You know, I think I'd better call Granny Rice. Maybe he could use it in his column tomorrow. The heck with that. We'll sell it to Jack Benny. <laughs> oh, you are a sneaky one, Gary. Elliot, it should be over if I... If I just can't hit anymore. If I can't play ball anymore, Ellie, I... I swear to you, I'll make life good for you. I mean it, Ellie, I'll... I'll learn to do something else. We'll have wonderful times together so you won't be bored with me. You big, stupid Dutchman. You shut up, you hear me? Oh, you dope, you. Lou. Lou, the first time I met you six years ago, that, that's when I started living. Don't you know that? I'm, I mean, you're it. You're the works. Don't you know that? It hasn't got anything to do with your batting average or music or anything like that. Have you got that straight? Come on, say it. Oh, no, look me in the eye. Come on, say it. I love you, Ellie. And who does a smiling Irishman love? Oh, Ellie. Come on, say it, or I'll... Smiling Irishman loves the dour Dutchman. Don't you ever forget that, Gary. The steak's burning. Thought I told you to shut up. <laughs> I've got a right to sing the blues. I've got a right to see no doubt. I've got a right to hang around. Down around the river, a certain man in this old town is dragging my poor heart around. I've got the right to sing the blues. I've got a right. Opera tickets, is it? I'll give you <laughs> opera tickets. Any time at all. I liked it. So did Charlie. Charlie, what happened to Sam? That for Sam. That Carmen sure is a crazy gal, isn't she? Well, you might say that. <laughs> oh, that's hot. You might say that. <laughs> Give them that a yell, will you? Uh, coffee time. How's he feeling? Well, first time since the season opened, he slept the night through. Did he find out what he was doing wrong from those pictures? Well, he... Thinks he may have been crowding the plate. But you don't think so, do you? Everybody on the team from Mac on down has been studying his batting for him. He's not doing anything different from the way he ever did it. And he hits one, and it's an easy fly ball. Mrs. Garrick, he's 36 years old. And he's been playing ball day in and day out for 14 years. Over 2,000 games, and he never missed a one. I'll give you one guess. Opus 711, Duke Ellington. Ellie, we're going to have to get rid of her. Huh? She's got no culture. Four or five. Make it a half a dozen. Throw in some bacon, too. Waffles? You talk me into it. Be about your business, girl. I got a train to catch. Good morning, Eleanor Twitchell Gehrig. Good morning, Henry Lewis Gehrig. And who do you love this morning? The Dower Dutchman. And who does the Dower Dutchman love? The smiling Irishman. I married the genius. See if these will hold you. Yeah, not for long. <laughs> Ellie, I'm going to snap out of it. I've got a feeling. You know, I always did hit good in Detroit. Well, you just forget about the homers, you hear? Just swing to meet the ball and the base hits will start falling in there. That's exactly what I'm going to do. You know, I've got it all doped out. I was thinking about it while I was shaving. I've been getting in my head that I'm weak. So I, I stand up there and I, I, I swing real hard. I, I swing too hard. And I'm off balance up there. I really think that's what it is. What do you think, Ellie? I think I love you. Oh, no, not really, Ellie. I, I mean, I really got it figured out. I've been going around moping like the world was coming to an end. I'm in a batting slump. I've had it before and I've got out of them. And I'll get out of this one, too. Let me get some butter. Right, it got some salve in the medicine chest. 
Ellie, I didn't even feel it. What? Could have burned it to the bone. I didn't feel it, Ellie. Uh, I'm going to get started. Uh, the train to catch. No! No, Ellie. I'm not going to see a doctor. Now, we've been over that a dozen times. There's nothing wrong with me, Ellie. There's nothing wrong with a few base hits won't cure. I'm a little tired, and I'm, I'm nervous, and I'm in a, I'm in a swamp. That's, that's all it is, Ellie. I'm, I'm just in the swamp. Motion about it. We'll spill coffee and batting snout. By a couple of good days, I'll be hitting them so that they'll make me use one of those batons. So I won't kill somebody. Right, hon? Right. I'll call you after the game, I get three hits. No bet. Hello, get me in Mr. Dickey's room, please. Bill Eleanor, look, no, no, Lou just left. Look, Bill, there's something wrong with the guy. Something very wrong. You just keep your eye on him, you see? And if anything happens, you... I don't know, like what? He seems to be losing his strength. He, he burned himself and he didn't feel anything. Bill, you, you get him to see a doctor. I mean, you, you make him see a doctor because... I'm... I'm afraid he's sick. In just a moment, we'll return to the second act of the Lou Gehrig story. And now your host, Bill Lundigan. You know, for the real outdoors man, this is only one of a hundred items to take on a camping trip. And when a sportsman like Ted here goes shopping for a car, he wants the most space he can get for carrying equipment. Wife Elaine watches while Ted measures this Plymouth Sports Suburban himself. And what does Ted find? That Plymouth platform is over six and a half feet long, not even counting the tailgate. More than enough room to hold even the biggest load. Of course, Elaine is thinking mostly about style. To her, the Plymouth is far ahead in this department as well, with Flight Sweep, the only really new design note this year. And that chrome carrier on top is not only extremely useful, but adds a smart styling touch as well. But it looks like Elaine has just found out, as you will, that Plymouth has a complete line of Suburbans. And here's another handsome model. A custom two-door, priced a bit lower. Seat six, choice of new V8 or six-cylinder engines, too, as with all Plymouth Suburbans. Now here's the Plymouth Custom Suburban four-door model. Seats eight, Third seat removed. And here's still another Plymouth Suburban model, the deluxe two-door. As in the others, the second seat pulls down for extra storage room. Yes, they're all big, they're all beautiful, and they're filled from road to roof with exciting new Chrysler Corporation features and extra values. 
Well, it looks like Ted and Elaine have already made up their minds about the one that they want. And whatever choice you make in a stunning Plymouth Suburban, you'll know at once why they set the pace for ruminous, for looks, and for riding qualities, too. And now, we return to Climax, tonight starring Wendell Corey, Gene Hagen, Harry Carey Jr., James Gregory, and Harry Town. Seti on third, DiMaggio on first. The Gehrig special right now will put the Yankees one run to the good here in the top of the ninth. Who's had a rough day so far? With a slow start for the big guy. But the blast right now would make up for a lot of that. There's the stretch, the pitch. It's a fly ball to right field, and it just didn't have an eye. So that snuffs out the rally, and Detroit wins it 3 to 1. For the Bengals, three runs on eight hits and one error. And for the Yankees, one run on six hits and one error. Another tough loss for the Bronx Bombers. An especially rough one for Lou Gehrig, who just can't seem to get started this season. Another 10-3 would have been over the fence for a run. Well, just one of those tough breaks. The guy's got lots of power. He's going to hit the ball again. You can't say... Power. What more proof does a guy need for Pete's sake? Hold it down. Well, he hit that one right on the nose. If I hit a ball that hard, it would sail right out of the park. So for him, it's a can of corn for the right fielder. I tell you, the guy's lost his power. I hit about five like that last year. They get up on that wind and die. This ballpark's real rough for that, Lou. I mean it, Lou. The wind blowing the other way, you'd have, it'd have dropped in there for a base hit easy. Even the weather's against me, eh, Bill? You're in a slump, Lou. Everything goes wrong when you're in a slump. You know that. The man's had it. He's done. Kaput. Hey, Lou, don't let me pick that movie tonight. When... Wait a minute, Bill. If there's anybody else, Mac would have had him on the bench a long time ago. If he keeps on this way, we'll be fighting to keep out of the cellar. You right, Bill? Am I hurting you, team? You're in a slump. That's not the question, Bill. Well, he doesn't answer those questions, Lou. Billy's got enough to do behind the plate without worrying about the other guys covering the positions on this team. And that goes double in spades for every man on this ball club. Now, if there's anybody here who feels I'm being overworked, thinks maybe I need a little help managing this team, let's hear from him. But before he starts shooting off his mouth, he better be pretty doggone sure he's batting over 400, or if he's a pitcher, he's pitching nothing but shutouts. Now, the floor is open to suggestions. All right. I've told you every day since this slump started that you're my first baseman. Now, if you don't feel you can handle the job, you come and tell me. I'll answer your question. Hey, uh, a little extra work out tomorrow, Mac? Sure. I'll get somebody to throw to you. Thanks. Got no call eating me out just because the guy tries to tell the truth. Why don't you grow up a little, son? Don't you think Mike knows the truth? Don't you think we know it? Don't you think Lou knows it too? Well, if he knows he's finished, then why doesn't he bench himself? When you've played for 14 years without missing one game, when you're half the ball player that Lou Gehrig was, ask me that question then if you have to. Better get a move on. I don't want to miss a single shooting. Got a beat, Bill. 
Well, there's nothing like a good old double feature for what ails you. Take a rate, take a rain check, Bill. Oh, now look, I'm treating. And when Dickie treats, boy, cut it out. What's the matter, I, I crippled or something? Huh. I'm just kidding, Lou. I've done that, you've done it back. Heck, I wouldn't want to count the number of times. I'm gonna belt me one right here, Bill? Nope. How about a good swift kick free, hmm? I just want you to go to the movies with me, that's all. You know I'm scared of the dark. I'll be with you in 30 seconds. Lou, if you just want to sit around, maybe read or something? I thought you were treating, Dickie. Hello? Speaking. I've got your party, New York. Go ahead. Bill, Eleanor, look, uh, I don't want Lou to know that it's me. Is he there? Uh, yeah, yes, Dave. It's good hearing from you. Bill, I have Dr. Graham here with me now, and I've told him Lou's symptoms, and he thinks it's very, very important that Lou have a complete checkup, and right away. Bill? Well, what can I do? how stubborn he is. He won't listen to me, but well, I thought if you talked to him, Bill, you might get him Billy? to go. I don't want you to ever pull a stunt like that again. Do you hear me? Now, do you hear me, Ellie? Yes, I hear you, Lou. When I feel so bad I need a checkup. I'll be the first one to know it. Lou, this is Dr. Graham. Lou, you're acting like a child. All we want you to do is take a few days off, fly up to Minnesota, and then... Oh. What's the matter with everybody? Well, you think I was... We haven't got an open day on the schedule for... I'm in a slump, that's all. It would look great, wouldn't it? In 14 years, I quit cold just because... But there's nothing wrong with me, Doc. But I'm... I'm not going to take any day off. Now, get that straight. Tell Ellie to get that straight, too. There's nothing wrong with me that a... a good day at bad wouldn't cure. Crazy for a minute there. Old piano like Jared. Boy, a minute there. He's been at it an hour now. How's he doing? Come on, Rusty. Let him take his swings in peace. Listen, I want to see him do good just like everybody else. Yeah, you've been beaten. Come on, come on, come on. Come on. Let's not act like a Tory. Now you're hitting them, Lou. Slow and easy. Okay, Hankus. Keep that ball up, will you, Hank?
curtain that James is standing in there. That's the lineup. Can't make it anymore. I just can't make it. Sluggers of all time and beyond doubt the most durable athlete in the history of sport. Yesterday he benched himself after a fabulous 14 year stretch during which Lou played in 2,130 consecutive ball games. A record which has not and will not be threatened. Although the Yankee management and Garrett himself claims that the benching is a temporary measure. Those of us who've watched Lou's pathetic performance this season feel that it may be the end of the line of the fabled iron horse. Send it, Mr. Garrig. Hello, Lou. Good morning, Doc. Oh, uh, that won't be necessary today, Lou. <laughs> After five days here, every time I see a doctor, I just automatically start to strip. <laughs> <laughs> Sit down, Lou. I take it it won't break your heart to leave us, is that right? Well, you haven't treated me well, but... Well, that's all over and done with now, Lou. What's the final score? Well... Uh, you might say... We were at bat at the end of nine innings. We're all tied up. Five days of test. Mm -hmm. No, uh, let's see how I can put this to you. You can put it to me straight, Doc. Yes, Lou, I believe I can. Well, when I said we're tied at the end of nine, uh, that sounds like a poor analogy. That's really not too far from the truth. What I'm trying to say, Lou, is a game that's tied can go on 10, 15, 20 innings. It depends on so many factors that... These uh, extra innings, you figure one inning for one year? You could look at it that way. Do you look at it that way? And after, say, 15 innings, is there a chance of winning? Or do we just play it out as long as it goes? But in the end, we have to lose? 
Well, not necessarily. I know I could die of heart failure tomorrow, Doctor. It's... Well, this other thing. Is it going to kill me? We'll be able to tell you more about that, Lou, in time. After we watch it progress, it's a rare type of paralysis. But somebody like you, with your body, your will. Is anyone who's uh, had this thing, has anyone else ever beaten it? Well, has anybody else ever played 14 full seasons of baseball without missing a single game? Hmm? It was funny. It ought to be about 8,000 questions to ask. I guess so. Well, there's no hurry, Lou. You'll be hanging around for a couple of days. You'll have to tell Mac and Ed Barrow. How am I going to tell Ellie? Oh, I know she's been making a nuisance of herself. She's Irish, you know, and well, she's got that temper, and when she wants something, she wants it pretty bad. So when she calls you again and starts pumping you, why, you just tell her I've got a fighting chance. We did not. Type this on an official form, send it to the Yankee office in New York. Mr. Edward Barrow. After a complete and careful examination, June 13, 1939 to June 19, it's been found that Mr. Lou Gehrig is suffering from amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, type of illness which involves the motor pathways and cells of the nervous system. And Dr. Adams' office. Doctor, it's Mrs. Gary. Mrs. Gary? Doctor, I know I said I wouldn't call it till five, but I... Well, that's quite all right. <clears throat> I have the reports here in front of me. I was just dictating a release for the newspapers which would define the nature of your husband's illness. It's, it's bad, isn't it? It's quite serious. I want to know, Doctor. Well, that's difficult to say, Mrs. Gehrig, as I was telling your husband just a few minutes I told you not to tell Lou in... I told Lou that he had a fighting chance. Sorry, thank, thank you, Doctor. Thank you for telling me that. And now, please tell me the truth. I've never had the privilege of meeting you, Mrs. Gehrig. But I think you can take this. I think it's something that you must know. Mrs. Gehrig? I'm still with you, Doctor. Well, your husband is suffering from a disease which we hope one day we'll be able to cure. However, at the present time, we know very little about it. Mrs. Gehrig? How long? Well, that's hard to say. But with his body, the, the shape he's in, why? Is there anything I can do? Try to keep his mind occupied. Try to keep him happy. Thank you, Doctor. And now, if you'll excuse me, I think I'd better hang up. We're going to keep him happy, you hear me, Maggie? We're going to have parties, and we're going to have people. We're going to have so many people, we'll have to put a revolving door in the joint. We're going to keep them happy, understand?
In just a moment, we'll return to the third act of the Lou Gehrig story. And now, once again, your host, Bill Lundigan. In the theater, when you have a hit, you can tell by the audience reaction. In the automobile business, we rate a hit by the nationwide acceptance it gets. And we know that we have a real box office smash with Chrysler Corporation's new push-button power flight automatic transmission. Here's how terrifically it's going over with America's car buyers. In Plymouth showrooms, push-button power flight gets the nod, especially from the women who enjoy its convenience and ease of operation. Dodge dealers report an overwhelming demand for the magic of push-button driving. And the sales at DeSoto, Chrysler, and Imperial dealers show that buyers are unanimous in their enthusiasm for this driving control from the future. <laughs> it's so easy, just push a button, step on the gas and go. Stop in tomorrow at one of our dealers and try push button driving in one of the brilliant new cars of the Forward Look 56 from Chrysler Corporation. And now we return to the third act of the Lou Gehrig story written especially for Climax by Mel Goldberg. In that eighth inning yesterday, I thought old Biscuit Pants here would grab himself a bat and put himself in the pinch head. Don't kid yourself. I thought about it. All right. <laughs> I'll never forget the time we were playing an exhibition game in Norfolk, Virginia. You know, this rookie kid was pitching for them. A big, tall, lanky, drink of water type lad. He, well, kind of reminded me of Billy Dickey here in a way. <laughs> Thanks, Maggie. Everything okay here? Oh, just great, Elmer. Just great. How about you, Gary? Well, Gary's just fine. Huh? Anyway, about the first three innings, you know, the boys are going up there, they're hitting the dirt every time this kid winds up. By the time the fifth inning rolls around, everybody's down on their knees praying to get out of the ball game alive. <laughs> I mean, they're walking up there and they're not digging in. They stand about six feet away from the plate, which is, well, it's the worst thing in the world they could do, you know? Because the way this kid's chucking them in, the safest <laughs> place in that ballpark was right in the middle of the plate. <laughs> I mean, he's not even coming close to it, you know? <laughs> Except old Fearless here. Oh, he's digging in there like this kid knows where the ball is going. And twice in a row, Lou's on his pants, and this kid is scared green. He keeps yelling in, I'm sorry, Mr. Gary. Gosh, old Marty, I'm sorry. <laughs> Lou sort of dusts himself off, and he waves back, and he says, well, that's all right, son. It's all in a day's work. <laughs> and then, pow! I thought somebody had been shot. Lou hits the dirt. This kid throws his arms up in the air, and he starts screaming, I killed Lou Gehrig! I killed Lou Gehrig! <laughs> I'm halfway out of the dugout with a bat in my hands. I don't know whether to carry Lou off or belt that kid one. And here's old Lou. He's just sort of dusting himself off and picking himself up off the ground, and he's shaking his head at that kid, and he's saying, You better watch that fastball, son. You're liable to hurt someone. <laughs> Yeah, as I remember it, the kid turned out to be a pretty fast country-style pitcher. Wasn't he it? was, Mac. Remember in Chicago when we were yeah, playing? Yeah, well, that's, uh, <laughs> that's another story, another time. Well, he... I'm sorry to break up the festivities, but we've got a little thing called a ball game hey, we got to play. Wait tomorrow. a minute. Where are you rushing to? It's early. Well, uh, maybe for well, you. Well, that's what we get for uh, bringing the manager along with us. Yeah. yeah. Thanks a lot. Good night, Lou. Good night, Good night, Lou. 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 Hello, it was a wonderful party. Thanks for having the guys oh, over. Man, really. always wonderful. Well, they had a great time, and you know that um, another business I was talking to you about? Well, kick it around a little with Ellie, will you? Let me know how you feel. Oh, Mac, I don't know. Come I don't on, think so. Come on, now, kick it around. Whatever way you decide is all right with me. Just uh, let me know. I'll, listen. I'll talk to you tomorrow. All right. Mac, why do the party? Hi, good night. Good night. <clears throat> Thanks for coming, man. Well, thanks for the use of the hall. Good night. Good night. Yeah. Was it fun? I love them one and all. Good. 
I'd like to see a little less of them, a little more of my wife. Maggie, why don't you just leave that stuff till the morning, hmm? All right. All right, folks. All right, Maggie. Kelly, come here. Why don't you sit right down here and fold your hands in your lap. I'm going to sit over here where I can see you. Now, go on, now. No, no, sit down. I'm going to talk to you. Good. Okay. Fire when ready, Gridley. Well, now, Ellie, I... I don't know exactly uh, how to Lou, say would this. Would you like some music? Ellie, I, I just want to talk. Well, that's serious? Well, no, not yet, but... Ellie, when I first heard about this thing, I... I was scared silly. Lou, there's no reason to be. I mean, the doctors no, all say... Never mind the doctors, darling. I said I was scared. Until I began to realize that... No matter what the book said about this... disease, even if I... Well... Even if the odds are against us, ever beating it, it wouldn't scare me. But it doesn't scare me, Ellie. As long as it doesn't scare you. Do I look scared, darling? Well, I'm not. I'm not because the, the, the simple truth of the matter is that I know you can beat this thing. I know it. So I, I wish you'd stop thinking about it. That's just what I was trying to say, honey. I don't think about not beating it. No, as a matter of fact, it doesn't really seem very important as long as we live our lives together just the way we always have. Oh, with a few changes, of course. Lou, I... Oh, I, I know. I can't play ball anymore. And, well, I can adjust to that. But I don't like to have to look across the crowded room to find my wife. We don't need parties, Ellie, to shut out the truth. The truth can't hurt us, huh? Not as long as we're together. No more parties. <laughs> no, Ellie, I, I don't mean no more parties. Lou, what do you want me to do? Oh, honey, I... I want you to stop asking me what I want to do. I want you to tell me what you want to do, and I... I want you to argue with me, and I want you to tell me I'm a big, stupid Dutchman when I'm wrong. Anything else, Dictator? Well, uh, Mac and Ed Barrow, and, well, Granny and some of the boys at the press, they, uh, they want to have a day for me. Yes, I know. What do you think? Who I think? Well, I think if, if I say yes, you'll brood about it, and then you'll sit up all night trying to write a speech, and you won't be able to think of anything to say, and then you'll blame me for getting into the whole mess. And then he'll decide it was all a giant plot to embarrass you because you think you really don't raise a date because nobody cares that much about you. In other words, you think I ought to let them do it. I think you better let them do it. <laughs> First game of today's traditional 4th of July doubleheader has just ended, ladies and gentlemen, and the Yankees lost it to the Senators 3-2. to two. There are upwards of 60,000 fans jamming this ballpark, and most of them viewed the first game with the same apathy that the Yankees played it. For the first time in this broadcaster's memory, the games themselves are taking a back seat to the between-game ceremony, the tribute to Lou Gehrig. Now, before the ceremonies begin, I'd like to chat with one of Lou's friends. Sitting here beside me is... Grantland Rice, the dean of American sports writers. That'll get you an argument any day in the week. What about this crowd here today, Granny? It's very impressive. Very, very rough on Lou, I'm afraid. I've seen the big guy sculled by a fastball that would decapitate an ox, dust himself off and dig in. But this, standing before a crowd and making a speech, this is murder. Did you help him with his speech? No, sir, I did not. I've heard Lou speak in public half a dozen times. He usually manages a pretty fair job. This is different. Everything is different. This isn't the rock of Gibraltar in baseball pants. This is just a sick man, a very sick man. And he knows that today, for the very first time, he's being honored not for being a great ball player, but for being Lou Gehrig. He could accept honors as a ball player. He knows that he's earned that. But for a guy like Lou, who can't understand being anything else other than a good human being, 
he can't honestly see what he's done to deserve this. And so he might not say any more than thank you. But if he says it in his own way, it would be a better speech than I could write for him if I had ten fingers in each hand. Somebody downstairs says Gary doesn't want to do it. Billy! Billy! The corridor's knee-deep in reporters. They want in. Well, they'll have to wait for Mac. What happened, Bill? Uh, beats me. He was sitting here in front of his locker, just sort of staring off into space. And then he got up and went to Mac's office. I asked him what was wrong. He said, can't do it, Bill. I just can't do it. Hey, boys, loose them. today, after 14 years, during which Lou rewrote page after page in the baseball record book, we're here to give him his day. Let's make it a good one. Thank you, Grandpa Rice. And Granny, don't go away. Well, the area around home plate is literally swimming with gifts, tributes. I won't even attempt to describe them to you now, nor will I try to name all the famous faces that are here. There in a group is one of the greatest baseball teams ever assembled, the 1927 Yankees. You just saw Babe Ruth, Bob Musial. Here's Wade Hoyt, Herb Pennock. Well, let's leave it at this. There isn't a name in baseball, past or present, who isn't here today to pay tribute to Lou Gehrig. The big bambino again, the Sultan of Swat. Many other dignitaries, some 60,000 of them. That's Joe McCarthy making the presentation. Some time ago, you told me that you thought that you were hindering the chances of the ball club by staying in the ball game. That was a day that I never had to see. Because I never thought that I would... Uh, that is, the time would come when you and I, well, we're not going to part. And even the Giants, even the giants from, across the river, from across the river, when we give our right give arm and feet, feet in a World, World Series, when they remember when they you, that's something. That's something. And when you have, when a, you have a, a wonderful, wonderful wife, wife who has shown more courage, courage than, I than I ever hoped to have, to have. that's really that's great. great. And when you've spent six, six years, years with a great little manager, manager like Miller like Huggins. Huggins. And the next time, with the finest, the finest smartest, smartest manager, manager in baseball, baseball today, today, Joe McCarthy. Joe McCarthy. And, and when you have when the you privilege have of roaming, eating, eating, playing cards, cards. and only one, one of the greatest fellas who ever lived, Bill Dickey, with all this, I consider myself the luckiest man on the face of the earth. I may have been given a bad break, but I've got an awful lot to live to live. Thank you.
Watch these four simple, basic lines. Notice how easily the four lines moved, then blended into flight sweep style. First, the wedge, because this is the fundamental basis of flight sweep styling. A shape that, that leans forward, that seems ready and eager to go places. It's a shape that could also form the basis of a jet plane. Or for that matter, a high-speed racing boat, like the ones we showed you last week. But you know we can simplify this, and when we do, we get this, the flight sweep symbol. A clean, uncluttered line that is the very essence of Chrysler Corporation's style. There isn't one line on this DeSoto that doesn't add to the overall forward thrust. Yes, even the line along the door. It's always straight, never broken, never a dip in it. And now, compare the basic shape of flight sweep styling with this. It's a completely static shape with not the slightest look of go to it, and yet it is the basis for the design of quite a few cars that were brought out this year as new. For the really new, we must look to this, flight sweep styling from Chrysler Corporation. Here is car design with a true look of motion, power in motion, long tapered lines that carry the eye from jaunty upswept tail without a break or dip, straight to the racy, forward slatting hood. Flight sweep styling. It's one of the exclusive extra values you'll find only in the cars of the Forward Look 56. Ladies and gentlemen, next week on Climax, sit down with death. The story of five people in an elevator, all unaware that their lives are about to be changed by an unseen sixth passenger whose name is Death. Appearing in the role of Philip Hardiker, Ralph Bellum. So it was suicide, eh? That's what you're thinking, isn't it, Inspector? Well, even though all four of the other people in the elevator denied knowing my son, I'm telling you that one of them killed him. If you can't find which one it was, I will. As Joe McKenzie, you'll see William Talman. I'm sorry, Alan. I'm so nervous about this strange invitation. I, I wish you hadn't accepted it. Playing Harold Johnson, John Williams. Well, I just don't see how anyone could have killed that boy, Inspector, since it was his gun. It was his own gun that killed him, wasn't it? Vicki Cummings will be seen as Liza Farley. Well, I didn't kill him, Inspector, and I don't believe anyone else did either. I think it's far more likely that the boy shot himself. And in the role of Ellen McKenzie, Constance Ford. My husband's worried, Inspector Grant. That's why he's so nervous. He thinks maybe I did it. Be with us next week when Climax presents this dramatic, suspenseful story, Sit Down with Death by William Irish, adapted for television by James P. Cavanaugh. And now this is Bill Lundigan saying thank you. And until next Thursday, please drive carefully. The mentally ill need your help. Support your local mental health campaign. Give today to your mental health campaign. Art Gilmore speaking. Portions of this program were pre-recorded. Climax.